Good morning. Welcome to the fourth of our talks on the four weeks of the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, which we're offering in place of the fall women's Ignatian retreat that had to be canceled due to COVID. You know, Ignatius from the very beginning understood the need to adapt the spiritual exercises to the circumstances of retreatants. And while we are sorry that you were not able to gather in person, we know that God's graces are flowing through your participation in this online offering. Let me begin with a prayer, and this is from Carla Maria Martini, a Jesuit. Lord Jesus, we ask you now to help us to remain with you always, to be close to you with all the ardor of our hearts, and to take up joyfully the mission you entrust to us, and that is con to continue your presence and spread the good news of your resurrection. Amen. Before taking up today's topic, since this, this is the final week, just a quick reca recap of where you've been in the first three talks of this series. In the first week of, sp of the spiritual exercises, we seek to know that we are loved sinners, redeemed sinners. We move during this period to being a forgiven, loved singer, sinner, one who is invited to participate in building the reign of God. Then in week two, we seek to know Christ more intimately, to love him more tenderly, to follow him more closely. As we walk through the events of Jesus' early life and his public ministry, we grow more and more to understand the patterns of light and darkness in our lives. We learn to make decisions freer and freer from disordered attachments, to follow God's lead in making our life decisions just as Jesus did. And we learn in week two that there's a cost to discipleship. We move during this period from spectator to willing participant in the building of the kingdom. In week three, we seek to deepen our gratitude and sorrow that Jesus died. We become confirmed in our willingness to accept the cost of discipleship. And so we move from compassion with Jesus in his suffering to confirmation of our own discipleship. In the fourth week, our focus for today's talk, we encounter the risen Christ as he consoles his friends and disciples, his friends and disciples who are in fear, confusion, and despair after his death. In this week, we ask for the grace to pray that we enter into Christ's joy in his resurrection and to know him in his role as consoler, to experience the consolation that Christ is always giving us through his loving presence, whatever the circumstances of our lives, just as he did for his friends. Ignatius asks us to pray for the grace in his words, to feel glad and rejoice intensely because Jesus rises in exaltation and in great power and glory. He suggests, Ignatius, that we strive to feel joy and happiness at the great joy and happiness of Christ our Lord. I want to talk a little bit about why that week for grace is such an important one for us, uh, about how Ignatius invites us to pray in week four, and some of the lessons that we take from that prayer. In his week four instructions, Ignatius invites us to note how the divinity, which seemed hidden during the Passion, now appears and manifests itself so miraculously in the Holy Resurrection. How it, Ignatius says, how it shines through the person of Jesus in all his appearances. Ignatius writes, the peace and joy which Jesus wants to share with me can only be a gift of God. The role of consoler which Jesus performs in each of his resurrection appearances is the same role he performs now. And he says, this is a faith insight into why I can live my life as a Christian and live my life in Christian optimism. That, that language, I think, gives us insight into the importance of week four. So, so to repeat that last part, the role of consoler which Jesus performs in his resurrection appearances is the same role he performs now, and this is why I can live my life in true Christian optimism. Well, another word for true Christian optimism is the theological virtue of hope. 
True Christian optimism is not a kind of mundane attitude that things will turn out fine. It's not a determined jollity. It's not an insistence that we always look on the bright side. It's not optimistically saying, well, you know, the glass is always half full, not half empty. It's not any of the other empty platitudes that we often use to try to shield ourselves from the difficulty of the world. And true Christian optimism is not blind or baseless witching, right? This is not, gee, I hope COVID doesn't interfere with my ability to fly to New York to see my family at Christmas time. Uh, it's not, hey, I hope those twins have a good season next year. It's not keeping my fingers crossed that I win the lottery, right? True Christian optimism, Christian hope, is our trust that in Christ, there will be triumph in ways we cannot guess or anticipate. It's confidence, not in human nature, but in God. Right? And it's trust that notwithstanding how horrendous things may look, that God is there and that we can trust that God's plan will be realized. Right? It's our trust in God's promise to Julian of Norwich. Remember, Julian of Norwich is experiencing the plague in England, experiencing disaster in the church, but is able to trust God when God says, all will be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Back in the fifth century, St. Cyril, the Bishop of Alexandria, wrote this in his commentary on the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Those who have a sure hope guaranteed by the Spirit that they will rise again, lay hold of what lies in the future as though it were already present. They say outward appearances will no longer be our standard of judging others. Our lives are all controlled by the spirit now and are not confined to this physical world that is subject to corruption. The light of the only begotten has shone on us and we have been transformed by the word, the source of all life. Some of you may have heard me recommend one or another book by Father Timothy Radcliffe, the former Superior General of the Dominican Order and a wonderful theologian. In his book called What's the Point of Being Christian, which I often recommend to people, Radcliffe argues that hope, what Ignatius is calling here true Christian optimism, that hope is the central gift that we as Christians bring to the world. If Christianity makes any difference in how we live and how we die, Radcliffe suggests it has to include how we convey hope to the world, how we point to what is not yet visible. Although not speaking in Christian terms, moral philosopher Eric Koffer speaks on the same thing, arguing that to, to show, to, we need, if we wish to transform the world, we cannot do it by coercing people into a new way of life. Rather, we have to know, and I love this phrase of his, how to kindle and fan an extravagant hope. How to kindle and fan an extravagant hope. That's what the early Christians did after the resurrection and ascension of Christ. The beginning point of the Christian proclamation was always the Easter event over and over again. The early disciples started with the empty tomb. And that's what we're called to do today, to live a life drenched in the consolation of the risen Christ and to share that with others, to live knowing that there is no suffering that cannot be redeemed and by our lives to convey that to others. But I can't share what I haven't experienced. Right? Whatever my lifestyle or ministry, I cannot participate in Jesus' role as consoler, in taking away fear, in giving peace, in sharing the gospel, without first experiencing Jesus' consoling role. Hence the importance of the prayer of week four of the exercises, to help us to grow into the knowledge and experience of the Jesus we relate to now the risen Jesus. Because Ignatius wants us to know resurrection was not an event of the past, but we live with the risen Jesus today. So let's talk about the prayer of week four itself. In week four, 
we pray with the post-resurrection appearances of Christ, including the accounts of his ascension and the coming of the Spirit. As many of you know, the first thing Ignatius invites us to pray with in week four is an episode that has no scriptural basis. It's Jesus' appearance to his mother. David Fleming's contemporary translation of this exercise instructs, although I do not have a scriptural account to guide my thoughts, I can easily know the excitement of Jesus in wanting to share the joy of his resurrection with his mother Mary, who had stood by him throughout the Passion. I let the delight and the love of this encounter permeate my being. There's a reason Ignatius includes this as the first of the exercises in week four, because for Ignatius, this meditation is a key to appreciating the depth of the intimacy that Jesus wants to share with us. David Fleming writes, Mary, with whom Jesus has known the most precious of intimacies of mother and son, is the first to experience the holy new depth of closeness, love, and consolation that Jesus' risen presence means. If through our contemplation we become privy to this most precious moment between mother and son, we will be able to grasp the import of all the other resurrection mysteries of the scripture. And this suggests if you pray with nothing else after this session, please spend time praying with Jesus' appearance to his mother, with, the, with his desire that she be the first person to share in his glory and to be with her in her joy with this encounter. And if you have prayed with this before, pray with it again. At one time or another, many of you have prayed with other of the post-resurrection appearances. Perhaps you've been with Mary Magdalene as she approached the tomb. The tomb's empty. She's confused. Panic sets in. They've stolen my Lord, she thinks. And then she sees someone she thinks is a gardener. When we pray with that scene, we see that confusion turn into joy. Mary says the figure and she recognizes Jesus. And we want to let ourselves experience the joy of that encounter, the feeling between the two of them. Or being with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. They thought Jesus was going to be the one. We were hoping he would be the one to redeem Israel. Now it's over. The dreams have been shattered. They're on the way back home, dejected, confused. And they meet a stranger, talk to him, invite him to dine with them. And then they recognize him in the breaking of the bread, right? Being fed um, and with the experience of that resurrection, of, of that, uh, blah, 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 blah. all right. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go back to, and they, rec and they recognize him in the breaking of the bread. And in a moment, the possibilities are all opened again. Life in place of death, we experience their realization that the resurrected Christ is present. Or you've prayed perhaps with the upper room, first without Thomas and then with him. Or been with the disciples on the shore of Galilee, being fed by the risen Christ, witnessing that beautiful colloquy between Jesus and Peter. Or stood with the disciples, hearing Jesus' last words before he ascended to, ascended to his Father. Right? I am with you always. Now, when you pray with these post-resurrection appearances on your own, you will, of course, experience exactly what God believes you need to learn from them about Christ and about yourselves. And we know that, that praying with any piece of scripture is a very personal experience. Having said that, let me share briefly some of the lessons that I think we can take from praying with the risen Christ that speak to our lives. First, praying with the post-resurrection appearances teach us to be attentive to small signs of resurrection in our lives and the lives of those around us. In an online 30-day retreat that he gave in May, the Jesuit Mark Thibodeau observed that Jesus' resurrection begins in a low-key way. Right? Jesus doesn't burst in, ta-da! Instead, we have quiet, incremental revelation. Right? An empty tomb then a resurrected Jesus who's not immediately recognized by his followers. And interestingly, when I made the exercise myself, my instruction for the tomb day prayer, the day that is in between week three and week four, was to spend time in that space of the death of Jesus until I began to experience the small stirrings of resurrection. And that's what we want to grow in our attentiveness to. We all know that our ultimate 
resurrection with Christ will not come until after our death. But we can find small signs of resurrection in our own lives, incremental signs, symbols of that ultimate resurrection. And the experience of the disciples on the third morning reminds us that resurrection begins with flutters of hope as opposed to a big explosion. The ability to smile after the depth of someone we're close to, sitting up in bed after a long illness, seeing an expression of joy in the face of someone who's been suffering after someone does something kind to them. I often in this context think of my visit to the Oklahoma City bombing site, where there's a tree there that took literally a full shot of that blast and still stands and still buds flow from that tree. I also think in this context of something Joan Chittister wrote in her book, In Search of Belief. She writes this, to say I believe in Jesus Christ who rose from the dead is to say I believe that the resurrection goes on and on forever. Every time Jesus rises in our own hearts in new ways, the resurrection happens again. Every time we see Jesus where we did not recognize him before, the faces of the poor, the love of the unloved, in the revelatory moments of life, Jesus rises anew. The real proof of the resurrection lies not in the transformation of Jesus alone, but in the transformation awaiting those who, who, who accept. So first lesson, looking attentiveness to small signs of resurrection. Second, we learn from the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus that consolation requires being attentive to what people need in order to see and believe. We see this story in Jesus' public ministry as well, what in Ignatian terms we speak of as the cura personalis, attentive concern to each individual, taking into account that individual's needs, the fullness of their needs, physically, emotionally, spiritually. And we continue to see that in the post-resurrection appearances. Jesus gives to each person he encounters precisely what they need in order to be consoled. For Peter, that means the insurance of forgiveness, of knowing that his denial of Jesus in the courtyard did not take away Jesus' love and charge for him. Three times do you love me, mirroring those three denials, right? And each time, feed my lamb. For Thomas, the invitation to come close and touch. For Mary, the instruction not to cling. For the disciples on the road to Emmaus, the interpretation of what referred to him in the scriptures. There's no one size fits all in Jesus dealing with people. Everyone gets what they need. And that's the model that we're meant to follow. I, I just came back from retreat and one of the homilies thought uh, I heard, and this was on the feast of St. Martha, um, the priest's comment was very simple. He said the, the difference, you know, the, the key in that story of Martha and Mary is not service versus non-service. It's giving people the service that they need, right? Being attentive to the needs of the individual. So that's the second lesson we learn. Third, we learn to be attentive when we pray with the post-resurrection appearances to the various ways and places in which we can encounter the risen Christ. Um, you all know that finding God in all things is one of the foundational principles of Ignatian spirituality, that I don't need to be in a church or kneeling at prayer to have an experience of the divine. And that's something that's underscored in the accounts of the post-resurrection appearances. Where is Jesus found? On a beach, cooking breakfast, right? On a dusty road, between Jerusalem and Emmaus, in the face of a gardener, right? in an upper room, right? alone, and in the midst of community. Right? Mark Thibodeau, um, in the retreat I mentioned earlier, talks about the in-between or ordinary moments, not the moments that we would necessarily have anticipated or predicted to be the important moments. And we know this is important. The danger is that if we expect to find Jesus, find God more generally, in only in one place or in one appearance, we're gonna miss him in all the other places. And it also invites us to stop clinging to old appearances and images that may not work for us. 
Fourth, importantly, we learn in the post-resurrection appearances that faith does not mean not having doubts. John's Gospel records that when Jesus appeared to the disciples in the upper room, Thomas was not with them. And when he returns and they tell him we've seen the Lord, he, understandably, doubts their account, hence his nickname, Doubting Thomas. And he says to them, unless I see the mark of nails in his hands and put my finger into the nail marks and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. The next time Jesus appears to his disciples, Thomas is present. Jesus doesn't condemn his doubt. Instead, he invites Thomas, put your finger into the nail mark and your hands into my side. And Thomas' disbelief quickly gives way to belief. He doesn't need to touch the wounds. That personal encounter is enough. And he utters the great confession of faith, my Lord and my God. Jesus doesn't get mad. He gives Thomas what he needs. And that's not the only occasion where we see doubt arising. Matthew records that the women coming away from the tomb, he says, were fearful yet overjoyed. And later Matthew tells us that when the disciples saw Jesus in Galilee, they worshiped, but they doubted. The way they worshiped, but they were doubted. The women were joyful, but they were fearful. And I think it's important for us to keep that in mind that even after the resurrection, faith is not automatic. And the disciples experienced some doubt because we all have moments when we have doubts, when our faith is weaker than others. And so I think it's important to acknowledge that they're there and important to see how Jesus reacted, right? He didn't reprimand the disciples. He didn't walk away. In their doubts, he continued to come close and speak to them, continued to reach them out. In their doubt, he still sent them out on mission. And the same is true for us. Jesus continues to come close, notwithstanding our doubts. Finally, we're reminded in the post-resurrection appearances of something so important to St. Ignatius, that our relationship with Christ is not a personal me and Jesus thing. It's intimate, but not exclusive. We grow in our relationship, in our experience of the risen Christ, so that we can take our place co-laboring in the building of God's kingdom. Since you're making this retreat at home, let me end with a reminder of Ignatius's advice for when one is praying with week four of the exercises. And I think his advice is particularly useful when we're making a retreat in daily living. Ignatius suggests that we make some modifications during the days to help us make the whole day more consistently prayerful. So first he suggests that as soon as we awaken, we recall the atmosphere of joy that pervades week four. And then throughout the day, he suggests that we try to keep ourselves in a mood which is marked by happiness and spiritual joy. And so we suggest anything in our environment that we can do to enhance this. We have some flowers in your room, right? To everything we can to reinforce that atmosphere of consolation and joy. And and part of what we're trying to do here is to become increasingly sensitive to those areas in my life and relationship where I experience new life, especially when we experience new life after a time of trouble and loss. If it's your plan after this talk, and I hope it is, to take a couple of days praying with the post-resurrection appearances before a small group sharing, I encourage you to take Ignatius's suggestion. Let me bring us to a close with this passion passage from the second letter to the Corinthians. But we hold these treasures in earthen vessels, that the surpassing power may be of God and not from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not constrained, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. For we who who are consistently being given up to death for the sake of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since then we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke. We too believe and therefore speak, knowing that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus, and place us with you in his presence. 
everything indeed is for you, so that the grace bestowed in abundance on more and more people may cause the thanksgiving to overflow for the glory of God. Blessings on your prayer, and may your faith and hope in the risen Christ be the foundation of your peace and happiness, even in times of struggle and suffering.